The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. A major deal in the UK banking sector as Nationwide Building Society agrees to buy Virgin money for £2.9 billion. Pounds. The European Central Bank keeps interest rates on hold for now, but cuts its inflation forecast. Plus, Aviva shares rise by 3% after a better-than-expected results statement and a £300 million share buyback. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. Virgin Money has today agreed to a takeover by a nationwide building society, valuing it at £2.9 billion. The takeover of Virgin Money, which is the UK's sixth largest retail bank by total assets, would create a combined group with total assets of approximately £366 billion and total lending and advances of roughly £283.5 billion. Nationwide, which would remain a building society following the takeover, said the deal would make it the second largest provider of mortgages and savings in the UK. It proposes to fund the acquisition from its existing cash resources. But joining me now to talk about this is Aquilo. Aquino, she's a retail banking and fintech reporter at the Financial Times. Aquila, welcome to you. Um, Nationwide's paying a 38% premium to last night's closing price, but it's getting the business at a 61% uh, it's 61 of book value. Is it, is it getting a bargain or is it overpaying? Um, well, it depends how you're, who you're asking, sorry. Um, I think for Virgin Money shareholders, some people close to the deal have said that it's a it's a low offer, um, but at the same time it kind of comes as a bit of, of a respite for the shareholders because uh, Virgin Money UK has had a kind of turbulent period since it had another takeover in 2018. Uh, it's kind of consistently um, missed performance targets. Um, also, um, you know, it, it wasn't profitable for a couple of years during the pandemic uh, because of big. PPI-related uh, compensation claim issue. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a, it might be a low offer, but also a respite for, for shareholders who think it couldn't go on like this. Yes, absolutely. As you say, the share price has gone nowhere for years. I mean, this is the latest challenger bank to succumb to a takeover. What does this say about the state of competition in the UK banking markets? So yeah, this is again the latest example and iteration of um, of the, the fact that uh, you need to be big to make it in, in UK retail banking. Uh, you need to be big to compete with the the big four, so Lloyd's, Barclays, HSBC, and NetWest. Um, and people have been talking for years about the need to you know merge the so-called challenger banks and the, the medium-sized banks like um, like Virgin and Metro and Co-op. Um, and yeah, it's been a busy year so far because uh, Tesco, uh, Tesco's bank, sorry, Barclays said earlier this year that it would buy um, Tesco's bank. And the co-op bank is also in talks with the Coventry Building Society for a possible merger. So, um, yeah, this is just the latest example of, of that. Indeed. I mean, you mentioned the Coventry Building Society looking to buy the co-op bank. It feels like mutuality is having a bit of a moment. Yes, it is. Um, so no, some people don't know this, but the Co-op Bank is actually owned by hedge funds who are in the US. So if the deal goes through, then it would be re-mutualized. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, so, so would Virgin Money um, if, if this deal goes through. Interesting to note that Nationwide doesn't want to retain the Virgin Money brand over the longer period of time. What, what does that tell us about the value of the Virgin brand these days, do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, some might say that it suggests that it's actually not that much of, of added value in that since uh, the, the, the merger and since it adopted that brand in 2018, um, you know, customers haven't maybe signed up en masse because of, of that brand. But it's also a cost-cutting thing probably because, uh, you know, it's expensive to um, keep the, the using the brand. So I think last year alone, Virgin Money UK paid 17 million to Virgin Money Group just to be using the branding and the name and, and, and the colour and everything. Now, Nationwide's already a pretty big player in both mortgages and savings. Why do you think it wants Virgin Money? Yeah, so a couple of reasons. I mean, it would be even bigger. So it's the it's the second largest mortgage provider currently in the country. Um, and I think, you know, if this deal goes through, its market share on mortgages would go from 
percent to 15, um, but also it's strategic because Nationwide has been trying to get into business banking for for a while, um, and it tried to do so organically itself, um, but had to kind of shelve those plans during the pandemic. And so, um, you know, if this goes through, then they will get Virgin's credit cards and their business banking, their SME lending book, which um, yeah would allow it to kind of fulfill its its strategic uh, goal. Can you see the Competition and Markets Authority having anything to say about this transaction? I, well, I'm, I'm not an expert in competition. I don't think, I think it should be fine. But I do think, you know, one of the reasons why the bigger the bigger players, the, the big four aren't, um, you know, they're probably having a look, but the, the reason why they're, they're not uh, putting in offers is, is competition related. But I think it should be fine for Nationwide. I haven't heard anything so far that suggests otherwise. OK, Akili, we have to leave it there. Good to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. And if you want to read more on that story, I've written some online analysis about how incredibly difficult it is for mid-tier banks to take on the big four lenders. You can find that on the Sky News website and app. If you just scan the QR code on your screen right now, you will get hold of that, my words, on this takeover. Now, there weren't many business-specific measures in yesterday's budget, but one eye-catching announcement was that AstraZeneca is to invest £650 million in the UK. The biggest company in the FTSE 100 will invest £450 million to research, develop and manufacture vaccines in Speak on Merseyside. A further £200 million will go on expanding AstraZeneca's presence in Cambridge, where 1,000 people will work alongside its existing £1.1 billion global R&D discovery centre, which already hosts 2,300 researchers and scientists. Building on the momentum that we have with our R&D centre, we have 2,300 scientists uh, in Cambridge now. It's the largest biosciences cluster in all of Europe. And collaboration is extremely important to the work that we do. Uh, so opening up the South site now to accommodate a thousand more people really was the logical place to place that investment. Well, we're just very, very briefly going to break into the business news to cross over to Washington, where the Swedish Prime Minister is speaking. The country, of course, has just officially joined NATO. The countries closest to us, both in terms of geography culture and values. The security situation this in our region has not been this serious since the Second World War. Russia will stay a serious threat to the Euro-Atlantic security for the foreseeable future. It was in this light that Sweden applied to join the NATO Defence Alliance, to gain security, but also to provide security. We have unique capabilities to contribute on land, in the air, at sea. Our support to Ukraine is a fundamental part of that. Ukraine is fighting bravely for its freedom, but they are also defending European freedom. At the same time, we are strengthening our defense and doubling the defense budget right now. From this year onwards, Sweden meets the NATO standard of 2% of GDP to defence spendings. This is important for NATO security, obviously, and to burden sharing. We are increasing the numbers of conscripts, strengthening civil defence and reintroducing civilian service in Sweden. We have been prepared for this task for quite a while. And I'm very pleased to take this very final step. Sweden is joining NATO. It's not the end of something. It's the beginning of something new. I look forward to making the world safer and freer together with the United States and all other NATO allies. And allow me, finally, a very short summary in Swedish. En väldigt kort sammanfattning på svenska. Det är en i sanning historisk dag. That's uh, Ulf Christensen, the uh, Swedish Prime Minister there in the White House, uh, to mark the fact that Sweden has officially become NATO's 32nd member. Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, was speaking a little earlier. We'll uh, bring you his comments uh, later on tonight here on Sky News. Now, as expected, the European Central Bank kept Eurozone interest rates on hold this afternoon, but a future cut may not be too far away. 
The ECB maintained its main policy rate at 4% for a fourth consecutive meeting, but it cut its inflation forecast this year from an average of 2.7% to 2.3%. percent we we'll join me now is Grace Peters, Global Head of Market Strategy at JP Morgan Private Bank. Grace, good to see you this afternoon. I mean, the significance, I guess, was that the ECB changed its language on inflation. It softened uh, what it said. There was definitely a dovish tilt, um, and I think a lot of that lends to the point that you made around the inflation numbers, not just for the current year, but when you look out to 2020, 2026, the anchoring of inflation around 2, 2.1 percent in those years, I think the market will read pretty dovishly. Um, some elements of the statement and, and the ensuing press confidence were as expected, as you mentioned, the policy rates on hold and a firm leaning into data dependency. Um, but our view is, and, and, and has been since the start of the year, it's going to be a June cut for both the Fed and the ECB, and I think the statement today reaffirmed that. They've reduced their growth forecast for this year from 0.8 to 0.6%. Yes. As we all know, Germany is in recession. Was there a case for saying they could have gone today? I don't think there was. I mean, the data isn't solid enough, I think, particularly when we look at wage data, to really reaffirm that disinflation is to the extent that it's going to get them back to their 2% target. Um, when we look at Eurozone growth, yes, it's weak, but actually there's signs it is starting to bottom out. Manufacturing probably bumping along the floor, but services, when we look at the more recent PMIs, actually seem to be accelerating. And that brings into question, you know, sort of how much disinflation we're going to see. As I say, our forecasts are that they will have enough data um, by the time we get to the June meeting um, to be able to make that call and start to cut. Yeah, of course, the next meeting is on the 11th of, of April. Why, why do you think uh, they'll wait until June? Yeah, President Lagarde in the press conference made a clear point that by the time April comes around, they'll have a little more information on both wages, um, on corporate profits as well, but really the bulk of the data will be received by June. So I think earlier than June is possible, but June to us is the most probable date. Now, separately, we've been hearing from um, Jay Powell from the US Federal Reserve this afternoon. I mean, you, I, I was struck there. You just you said you think the Fed and ECB will both go in June. Yes, that's right. So we've got them both going in June, and we've got for, seven, for the Fed 75 basis points and 100 basis points for the ECB. Um, I also think it's important not to anguish too much month by month, meeting by meeting, which one it is. The point to us is that central banks are very much advocating disinflation is here to stay. It'll be bumpy along the way, but we're on that path. Um, and therefore, when it comes to the investment implications, they're quite clear to us um, that equities, I mean, we had a call equities would make all-time highs, and we see another one of those um, today for the US. I think that can continue further. And when we think about, you know, back to the ECB and, and the inflation uh, tweaks they made today, that also reaffirms to, to me that you can think about European duration um, because inflation is coming down um, over the more medium term. You better, you better explain to uh, viewers not in the weeds of this what you mean by Euro European duration. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, sort of many uh, of our clients and people across the market, I'm sure, are sat in cash and they're enjoying quite juicy cash yields at the moment, but thinking, well, once central banks start cutting rates, for how much longer will those cash yields be available? And to us, we think that's as good as it gets for cash. So where do you put your money? Um, you want to lock in those yields and you want to extend duration, i.e. The, the, the number of the period of time over which those yields will be locked in. Um, for longer. We think the front end of the curve, so let's talk about one to three years, is attractive. But when we think about adding beyond that period of time, more medium term duration, um, we think that's attractive, particularly because growth in Europe is weaker and arguably with duration um, should um, the ECB need to do more cuts in the markets priced if growth weakens in that scenario than from a portfolio context, um, you actually have some nice downside risk protection. Now, if we'd been having this conversation just a few short months ago before Christmas, we would have been saying, well, the ECB, the Fed, they're bound to cut rates some point in the first quarter. Have you been surprised at the way expectations have repriced? So our forecast has been for June, and that's been the case since um, our 2024 outlook that was the beginning of December. The market obviously took a slightly different view um, with some of the very disinflationary prints that we got through the fourth quarter. Um, pricing for cuts for the Fed went as, you know, as much as 160, 170 basis points. Um, the fact that that's now come back to, you know, three to four cuts, so around 75 basis points of cuts, um, that to us feels more 
sensible. But the important thing to me is, you know, why is the market coming? It's because growth is strong. Financial conditions obviously have, 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 have loosened when we look, think about the, the risk uh, rally. Um, and that's quite a healthy environment for equities. So back to another place, where can I move my, my, my cash? The equity markets to us um, can push higher. And I think actually, if anything, after the ECB today, you know, the European equity market, particularly European large cap multinationals, um, they've been a really good place to be and I think that will continue. Good, an upbeat note on which to end. Grace, good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Some other business news stories for you now. And shares of Aviva have risen by as much as 3% today after the insurance giant reported better than expected annual results and announced a £300 million share buyback. The UK's largest diversified insurer reported an operating profit of £1.47 billion for 2023. That was up 9% on 2022. And it also said it was targeting a figure of £2 billion by 2026. Well, Aviva, which now has more than 19 million customers, said its general insurance business had performed well, considering adverse weather in Canada, storms in the UK and the impacts of inflation, reinsurance costs and higher claims frequency. The FTSE 100 aircraft engineering group Melrose said today it expects profits this year to be better than expected. The company, which makes components for aircraft engines and whose airframe technology and electrical distribution systems are found on most modern aircraft, said this would be due to stronger sales growth in engines in particular. Operating profits for 2023 came in at £420 million, up from £186 million in 2022. The government is seeking to have the entrepreneur Lex Greensill disqualified as a director. The insolvency service, which is part of the business department, filed a director disqualification claim in the High Court earlier today against Mr Greensill. Well, Mr Greensill's supply chain firm, Greensill Capital, whose advisers included the Foreign, sorry, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, collapsed in March 2021. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this Thursday afternoon. Stay with us.
Slight image. Slight better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Well, on the foreign exchange market this afternoon, the pound has hit its highest level against the US dollar since the 28th of December last year. That follows comments I was referring to earlier from the US Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell. That's rekindled hopes of interest rate cuts in the near future. Sterling up nearly half of 1% against the dollar. It's up uh, an eighth of 1% against the euro. Well, that's also delivered a boost to uh, Wall Street this afternoon. The S&P 500 has hit a fresh all-time high today. Talking points this afternoon include the lingerie maker Victoria's Secret. That's fallen nearly 30% following a disappointing trading forecast. Well, European stocks have all uh, traded to the upside this afternoon. That's how they finished on mainland Europe. Highlights today include Novo Nordisk, Europe's biggest companies, up another 8.5% to a fresh all-time high in Copenhagen after announcing positive early trial data for a new obesity drug on which it is working. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 has also finished in positive territory, albeit not uh, up as much as in mainland Europe. Gains for industrial stocks have been balanced out with losses elsewhere. Where no doubt about the leading FTSE gainer in percentage terms today. It's Rentacle Initial up 18.5% or 17.5% there as results came in ahead of expectations. It's a very busy day for company results, seven in the FTSE alone. The Thermal Solutions Group, Spirac Sarco, has finished up nearly 4% on its results. To the downside, Entain, that's the owner of Labrooks and Corals, of course, that has fallen by some four and three quarter percent. Results there not going down too well. Outside the FTSE 100, the Industrial Threads Group, Coates has risen by 8% on a trading update, while the cybersecurity group Dark Trace is up by a similar amount after predicting sales growth this year of up to 25%. As for the oil price, well, that has drifted lower as the session has gone on today. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $82.90 a barrel. Actually, it's more, more or less unchanged now. That has rallied in the last 20 minutes or so. Well, joining me this afternoon is Chris Beecham. He's Chief Market Analyst, of course, at IG Group. Chris, great to see you. Um, Aviva uh, published their results today. I mean, another sort of steady performance, really. It's almost becoming reliable. <laughs> yes, it is getting to that category, I think. Now, a string of good updates really, over the year, last year or more. Uh, for Aviva and the buyback, of course, the magic word uh, for investors. They're really doing, I think, a lot of the heavy lifting for the share price today. But uh, solid numbers and one of the stars of the FTSE 100 over the past couple of years, really firmly outperforming the wider index. Yeah, Amanda Blanc, Blanc working her magic. Now, busy day for company results outside the FTSE. I mentioned Dark Trace in the market report. It's having quite a good run. Yeah, cyber security firm. And of course, AI was the magic ticket, really, for stocks at the moment. Um, last year had a terrible year. Short sellers, a series of scandals didn't go down very well at all. But it looks like it's turned a corner. I think a very solid update, warning of, obviously, the more AI comes into use, the more the cyber security threats come into play. So the tone of the results this morning, very optimistic, I think, and the share price um, showing a reflection. I think the investors hope that more good news lies ahead. Absolutely. And staying in the uh, mid-250, ITV, I mean, the, the share price has had a good reaction to the results today, but longer term. Yeah, and advertising revenue is really not coming back yet, I think, despite maybe the, the corner being turned for the UK economy, people aren't spending as much anymore. So still that major problem. Better revenues from its studio numbers. So in the global battle of content, there is at least uh, one good engine there. And again, buyback news from ITV, although that was previously announced. Yeah, I mean, we've had a stack of these takeovers in the mid-cap space, you know, Red Row, Win Canton, I could go on. Um, ITV is often named as a potential bid candidate. Never seems to materialise. No, I think it, it's probably got too many little other operations going on to really make it a firm candidate, really, and then you're getting into uh, broadcasting. It's a bit of a, a dangerous area for a lot of people. So it, it's interesting that the UK market is so attractive to foreign investors and yet in individually UK investors aren't so keen on it and yet there are a lot of bargains on offer really. Yeah, I mean, can, can you see more of this M&A activity in the, in the sort of FTSE 250 space? I think so, really. Uh, we had a couple of others earlier in the week, at Spirit Comms, of course, yes. um, disappearing or eventually uh, off the register. So that, uh, there are clear opportunities, really, um, for a lot of investors. Yeah, and Virgin Money today, of course. What about what's going on in the currency markets? I mean, this is, this is more dollar weakness than sterling strength we're seeing this afternoon. 
certainly for, for the pound against the dollar, yes, because while Powell has stuck to the line of we don't want to cut rates too soon, the hint from him has been, but we still will do it this year. And I think you've seen the repricing over the course of the last so three months. We were too keen on expecting rate cuts from the Fed in the first half of the year, but we know they are going to come. So that's why the dollar is finally taking a bit of a knock this afternoon. What sort of, uh, where's the weight of your client money right now in terms of the FX markets? Do people expect this sort of rally in sterling to carry on? I think they're, yeah, they're putting some money to work behind it, really. The expectation is that maybe there's a slightly better outlook from the budget has given the pound a lift. And while you also expect the Bank of England to, to join in the rate-cutting party at some point, it looks like the Fed might move before Threadneedle Street. Yeah, I think uh, that's a fair bet, that, uh, that Craig, uh, Chris. Good to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from me. I'm back again with Business Live tomorrow morning at half past 11. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up after this short break, it's Mark Austin with the News Hour. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Cheerio.